So in this video, I'm going to be reviewing the Raiden RD 6018 power supply. If you're in the market for a new power supply and need a whopping great amount of power output, then this might be the power supply for you. I also want to mention I paid full retail price for this out of my own pocket, so rest assured my opinion isn't skewed in any way. So, let's get into the video. Here is the TLDR version. If you're in the market for a powerful power supply, capable of 60 volts 18 amp output with an easy to use interface along with the option of Wi-Fi or USB connectivity for remote control and monitoring then the Raiden RD6018 might be a welcome addition to your workshop provided your application doesn't require ultra smooth power. We'll get more into that later in the video. Have you ever found yourself situated in a paddock full of cows and need to order circuit boards? Yeah, me neither. But if I did, I would use this video's sponsor, JLC PCB. Five circuit boards cost as little as $2. They offer fast production time and with a multitude of design options, you're only limited by your imagination. Ordering is as simple as going to jlcpcb.com, uploading your Gerber files and choosing your design preferences. You can also choose any colour solder mask at no additional cost. And if you're new to designing circuit boards, then check out my KiCad circuit board series to get you started. Look, look Daisy, free circuit boards. Alright, let's begin by unboxing. You might be surprised to know the power supply module can be purchased separate from the enclosure and switch mode PSU. The power supply module, enclosure and switch mode PSU can all be purchased separately or as a kit you assemble yourself. Inside the box I received a spare fuse which can be installed into this socket on the PCB if the factory soldered in fuse were to ever fail. Depending on what model you purchase, you might receive a Wi-Fi board which gives you the ability to control the power supply from your phone, which I'll be testing out later. Lastly, there is a temperature probe and two crimp terminals included in the box. Included in my kit was this very well constructed metal enclosure. I was quite impressed by the build quality of the enclosure with its all metal construction and durable coating. The enclosure comes with a power socket and all the necessary wiring for assembly. Lastly, my kit includes a 68 volt, 17 amp switch mode power supply. To assemble my power supply, first I remove the enclosure cover. Next I installed the C14 socket with the included screws. Now the power switch is snapped into the enclosure, followed by installing the external temperature probe header. You may be wondering why a power supply needs an external temperature probe, and that would be a good question. And the truth is, this power supply also doubles as a battery charger. The temperature probe can be taped to the case of a battery to display the battery temperature while the power supply charges it. Next I installed the rubber feet. The power supply is mounted inside the enclosure using the included screws. Now I could install the wiring kit to connect the C14 socket and power switch to the power supply.
Since this power supply can output some hefty current, two pairs of wires are used to connect the 68 volt DC output to the power supply module. A CR1220 button battery is installed into the button battery holder on the PCB. This battery is used to keep the system clock time accurate. Now we can install the Wi-Fi board. The power input terminal can be unplugged from the board. These wires came pre-tinned with solder, which I don't recommend for use with screw down terminals. So I chopped off the ends and stripped the wires back. The ends were then twisted and folded over before installing them into the screw down terminal. The temp probe header can be plugged into the board followed by the power input terminal. Now all that's left to do is reinstall the cover and the power supply is fully assembled. Now I can plug in the temperature probe and power cord. Once the power supply boots up, the display shows the output volts, amps and watts. On the right hand side we can see the input voltage from the switch mode PSU is 68.5 volts. VSET is the programmable output voltage and I set is the programmable output current. And lastly we have the overvolt protection limit and overcurrent protection limit. To set the output voltage, first press the V set button. Then you can use the arrow keys to select the decimal place that you want to change. Now you can turn the dial to raise or lower the value. Or you can use the numeric keypad to enter your desired output voltage value. Setting the output current is the same process Press the I set button and use the dial or keypad to change the output value. Once you've set your output voltage and current, press the on off button to switch the output on. There are 9 programmable presets to choose from. To recall a preset, first press the shift button, then choose a preset between M1 to M9. To store a preset, first enter your desired settings, then press the mem button. Then choose one of the 9 slots to save to. To enter the menu, first press the shift button, then key 0. Feel free to pause the video if you'd like to read all the settings available in the menu. On the next page you can choose between two screen modes. The default numeric display, or a graph showing voltage and current over time. I'll show both display modes later in the video. Let's move on to the output binding posts. Like most power supplies, there are three binding posts. Black, green and red. Pretty typical stuff. However, what's not typical is the green binding post is not a grounding post. Instead, the green binding post is used for charging batteries. Alright, let's test how accurate the voltage output is using my Bryman meter. As you can see, the output voltage is pretty much spot on across the board. Good stuff! Now let's test if there is any voltage overshoot when the output is switched on. I have the output preset to 60 volts. 
and the highest voltage that my meter recorded was spot on at 60 volts. Well done Raiden. Now let's test the full time of the power supply. Despite the large smoothing capacitors, the full time is basically instant. Later I'll hook up my oscilloscope for more in-depth testing. However, before that, let's try charging a battery. For this demo, I'll be charging this 18650 lithium cell. To connect the battery to the power supply, I'm using an 18650 cell holder with banana plugs. The negative of the battery is connected to the black post on the power supply, and the battery positive is connected to the green post on the power supply. Lastly, the temperature probe is taped to the battery to monitor the temperature during charging. Once the power supply detects a battery connected to it, the battery icon turns red and the current battery voltage is displayed along with the temperature. To charge this battery, I've programmed a maximum voltage of 4.2 volts and 1 amp of current. Now I can start charging the battery. I'll change the display mode to show the graph. You can change the volts per division by turning the dial to zoom in or out. The green line is the output voltage and the blue line is the output current. As the battery nears full capacity, the current declines as can be seen on the graph. This feature is almost like having a basic oscilloscope built into the power supply. Once the charge current drops below 100 milliamps, the power supply will automatically stop charging. With regards to the battery temperature probe, I did wonder if the power supply had a thermal shutdown function if the battery temperature was either too high or too low. I couldn't find anything in the manual on this subject, so to test if there was any thermal protection, I placed the probe into a cup of hot water while the power supply is charging a battery. With the temperature reaching 80 degrees C and the battery still charging, it seems there isn't any thermal shutdown function here. Just for giggles, I also tried ice water to bring the temperature down to 4C, and you won't be surprised to know that the power supply kept charging the battery the entire time. To be clear, Raiden didn't mention anything about a thermal shutdown function for battery charging, so the results are hardly surprising. Now let's move on to inspecting the output using my oscilloscope. With an output voltage of 4.2 volts and no load connected, as expected there is no low frequency ripple to speak of here. However, there are quite a few transient spikes with a peak to peak voltage of 636 millivolts. I'll raise the output voltage up to 12 volts and take another look at the waveform. Basically we're seeing the same as before, with slightly reduced transient spikes at 416 millivolts peak to peak. Now let's introduce a load into the equation in the form of a 50 watt light bulb. Tungsten filament bulbs are a resistive load. They're a great choice for inspecting power supply waveforms since the bulb doesn't add any unwanted noise to the power lines. With the load added, the bulb is drawing 4.3 amps of current. We can now start to see some low frequency ripple, which measures roughly 90 millivolts peak to peak. Not bad performance considering the price point. What's not so good is the transient spikes have increased to almost 800 millivolts peak to peak. Ouch. In an effort to reduce these transient spikes, and for the sake of experimenting, I grabbed a 1 microfarad ceramic capacitor and connected it across the output terminals. Once again using the bulb as a load, we can see the transient spikes were significantly reduced. Comparing the two tests side by side, the gains offered by a humble 10 cent capacitor are pretty impressive in my opinion. Right, let's move on to testing with a bigger load. I broke out my DIY resistive load tester, which used to be a 2000 watt heater, and connected it to the power supply. With almost 9 amps of current being consumed by the load tester, 
the low frequency ripple has increased slightly to 140 millivolts. All in all, not bad. For the sake of comparison, once again I repeated the test with the addition of the ceramic capacitor. As expected, the transient spikes were significantly reduced. Finally, let's draw the maximum allowed current of 18 amps. On the scope, I measured the transient spikes at almost 2 volts peak to peak, and the low frequency ripple at 520 millivolts. I left the load tester running at 18 amps for around 15 minutes to see if the power supply heated up. I was pleasantly surprised that the case temperature was only about 10 degrees above ambient. Even the power supply exhaust fan was running relatively cool. Good stuff. Before I pack the scope away, I tested for voltage overshoot, and I'm delighted to say there isn't any. Towards the top of the wave it gently rolls over with no overshoot. Nice. Now I'll show you how to connect my smartphone to the power supply. First go into the menu and change the interface mode to Wi-Fi. Once done, power off the power supply. Next grab your phone and download the RD Power app from the App Store. Open up the RD Power app, open the hamburger menu, and select network distribution. Enter your Wi-Fi password, and then select initialization. Now we need to turn our attention back to the power supply. First turn the power supply on and wait for the power supply to connect to your Wi-Fi network. Once the power supply finishes setting up, on your phone tick the box and press confirm. Then wait for the phone to finish setting up. This can take a while so just be patient. Once finished you'll be greeted by a set of controls. Before we can control the power supply we need to press the connect button at the top of the screen. Now we have complete remote control over the power supply. We're able to program the output parameters and switch the output on and off. We also get a really neat power graph that plots power over time. What's more, if you're charging a battery, the app also displays the battery info which is super handy for remotely monitoring charging if you're not in front of the power supply. Before we conclude this video, since I saw a good reduction in transient spikes with the addition of the ceramic capacitor, I wanted to modify my power supply by adding a capacitor across the positive and negative binding posts. After removing the module from the enclosure, we can see the end of the binding posts soldered on the back of the PCB. This is where I'll be soldering my capacitor to. Instead of the ceramic capacitor, I'll use a 100 nanofarad polyester film capacitor since this capacitor is rated well above the maximum 60 volt output from my power supply. The leads are bent and insulated with heat shrink before soldering the capacitor across the positive and negative binding posts. A blob of hot glue helps to hold the capacitor in place. With that done I can reassemble the power supply. After this modification I hooked up my scope and here are the results. Without the capacitor the transient spikes were over 700 millivolts peak to peak and with the capacitor the peak to peak voltage was reduced by over 50% down to 340 millivolts. So conclusion time. Really the only negative I found was the relatively noisy output. However since this is a switching type power supply this is to be expected to a degree. If you need a super smooth power supply then perhaps consider a linear regulator type power supply. 
However, if you're in the market for a powerful power supply capable of 60 volts output at a whopping 18 amps, with an easy to use interface along with a good looking display, not to mention the added bonus of Wi-Fi connectivity for remote control and monitoring, then the Ryden RD6018W might be a welcome addition to your workshop. Now if you want to help my channel out and support my videos, there'll be affiliate links to purchase this power supply down in the video's description. If you can use those, it gives me a small kickback at no cost to you and helps keep the content free for everyone to enjoy. Thank you to all my Patreon supporters and to all you, my faithful YouTube viewers. You guys are awesome. I'll see you in the next video. Bye for now.